thank you very much, and of course I'm very glad to be here, and very, uh, it's a big honor for me to be invited to this, to this conference, very, very nice QNADO conference. Uh, but last, as last speaker of the day, maybe my task is quite difficult. I hope you, I'm not going to be too boring. So we have the second drum of the day, certainly the last one. The second from the Serge Lab, the second from the Nano Team. And as you can see, the size distribution of the Jerome is the same. We are very small together, so I hope you see me. But anyway, so uh, uh, the, the life cycle I wrote in this title, in fact, is, is not related to the life cycle assessment as we had is really trying to see the exposure through the life cycle of a product. So maybe I should ch change the term to value change or different stages of a product, not to be confusing. So, uh, and I will not only talk about sunscreen because you can see that, you will see that we have also, we are also working on other type of product. So as an introduction, you know, there is a large variety of nanomaterial, whether on, based on their chemistry, we can have metal, sul metal sulfide, metal oxide, carbon, I mean, so many. Of course, the shape can be very different from very simple shape to a very complex uh, multipode. So the chemists, they, they, are, really, they are very uh, uh, creative to make uh, very different kind of shapes. But also, uh, based on, the, on their origin, we have a different kind of way to synthesize some uh, particles, but also some particles, nanoparticles can be uh, naturally occurring. Here you have a nice example of uh, aluminosilicate uh, naturally occurring nanotubes. Generally, they occur in volcanic soils. They, call they are called immobilite. Uh, and it's easy to synthesize this kind of uh, naturally occurring uh, immobilite. And what is interesting is that when you go to soils that are rich with immobilite, you have the time scale with you because you can look at how these immobilite uh, are interacting with bacteria in a natural soil. And so you can see, uh, after a long term, uh, how the ecosystem, the territorial ecosystem can, can, can react. So it can be a very natu uh, interesting uh, uh, natural analogs. So, and of course, you know that there is many uh, products in which nanoparticles are, or nanomaterials are incorporated. Even if it's sometimes difficult to be sure in which kind of products the nano are, are incorporated because there is no obligation uh, for the declaration of nano in, in, in the, on the market. So sometimes you, you know that you have nanoparticles, titanium nanoparticles in sunscreen, but you don't have the nano specification. So they can be used uh, because of their properties like uh, UV absorbers or uh, antimicrobial or self-cleaning surfaces. So there is a lot of properties that are very in interesting for the industry. Uh, but also you know that uh, the incorporation of nanomaterials into a product generally comes with a modification of the, of the, of the particle themselves. Generally, it's their surface modified. Uh, and sometimes it's quite complex, and I will show you the example of the sunscreen. It's not very simple stuff. And so then we have the question uh, of uh, when we are, as a group, working on, 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 on nano, what is the priority? On, on which kind of particle do we have to focus the effort? Because we cannot play with all the nano we can find. And so should we work on bare nanoparticles, on coated, but which kind of coating? Uh, is it possible to extrapolate what we obtain as a result with bare to coat it? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's quite complex. And we had a nice explanation of what is done at the UC Saint for the next four years, how, how to select the new nano to work with. So it's, it's quite complex. And of course, uh, because they are synthesized, uh, the first people that certainly uh, exposed are, of course, the workers. And if accidental release uh, occur, of course, the environment, the environment is also exposed. But what we tried to, to start now, uh, six, six years ago, yeah, we tried to also take into account the fact that consumers now start to be exposed. And so what we try to do is we try to select a few uh, products, uh, self-cleaning glasses, paint, sunscreens, that I will detail uh, a little bit more. And we try to uh, reproduce the use of this kind of commercial, commercial product to try to see if some particles, nanoparticles, byproduct are released from this matrix that are already on the market. And then, of course, trying to, to check whether when they are released in the environment, the they behavior is the same or is different from compared to bare nanoparticles for, for which we start uh, to have quite a information, not good information, but we start to have some information. Uh, so the, the, the first example I want to, to, to detail is, uh, of course, the sunscreen uh, is included in, in the title. So we know that titanium dioxide is used as UV absorber. And uh, if you really look carefully at the nano inside this uh, commercial product, you can see that uh, using TM images that they are really nano. So uh, the idea we had was not to look at the direct exposure. So for instance, looking at the transfer 
of nanos through the skins. But the idea was really to determine the indirect exposure of human or ecosystem. Because we know that when we put some sunscreen on, on the body, as soon as we swim or even later when we take a shower, the, the nano will be released in, 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 in aquatic systems. So that was really the, the scenario we tried to, uh, to, to work with. Uh, and why nanoparticles, titanium nanoparticles, are used in this uh, in this product? Uh, just I would like to say that uh, the, the the work was not uh, sponsored by uh, any uh, uh, L'Oreal <laughs> company or other uh, cosmetic company. So we did with our own money. So, uh, but in fact, if you see the, the the first argument was in fact because when it's nano, it's not white. So you have a, a invisible cream, which was a commercial argument. But in fact, there is a much more interesting to me. Uh, better argument, which is the efficiencies as UV absorber. As you can see here, the absorbent capacity of the 15 nano is much better in the UV uh, energy uh, range, which is, to me, the, the better argument. So the point is that my background is in geology, so I don't know exactly how they do this cream, but it seems to be quite complex. And there is two strategies uh, for the cosmetics company. So whether they use a hydrophilic uh, composite or a hydrophobic composite. So you have different kind of product you can find on, on, the, on the market. And then this composite based, of, of course, of titanium dioxide are incorporated into the emulsion. So I will not detail all the, the composite that we tested. Uh, Jerome already mentioned some of them in terms of size, distribution, etc. So I will try to focus more on the hydrophobic one because as an hydrophobic product, we suspect uh, complex behavior and natural system. So uh, and we, if we look a little bit more carefully on the structure of this hydrophobic uh, let's say composite or compound that is used in sunscreen. Of course, the core is made of titanium dioxide. Uh, it's generally, it's rotile. Uh, but as you can see, there is two layers. The last layer, is, it's a siloxane, which is an hydrophobic layer, so made of silicon and um, met metal groups, which give the hydrophobic properties. And there is an intermediate layer, which is made generally of, so aluminum oc hydroxide or oxyhydroxide is not really clear from the literature, even from the characterization. Anyway, an aluminum uh, layer. And at the beginning, we did not really understand why this layer was adding. We suspected just uh, that it was more convenient uh, to adsorb the, 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 the PDMS on the titanium. In fact, it came to us that the, the reason is very simple. Because, of course, titanium dioxide is a UV absorber, but you know also it's a photocatalyzer. So as soon as, as, soon as uh, the energy is absorbed, then you have this redox uh, mechanism inside the, the titanium. And if the titanium is in water, then you have a uh, generation of reactive oxygen species. So the idea is really to have a uh, uh, confinement of this core of titanium to avoid this direct interaction with water and, and skin, of course. So in fact, when you test this kind of product, they are not generating ROS, which is certainly the design of uh, the, the idea behind this design. So it seems to be, so again, I was not paid by the company. So it seems to be like a, a, a Safe by design, I don't know if it if, if can be considered an example. So now when you think about uh, dispersion in water, if you think about uh, any metal oxide, and Jerome uh, tried to give some equation about how uh, uh, nanoparticles can be dispersed in water, so the si we can have some prediction as, uh, as he tried to show. If you look at the zeta potential of any oxide, uh, metal oxide, of course you have a positively charged uh, pH domain, a negatively charged pH domain, and a, of course, a isoelectric point. And so you can predict that when the, uh, the you are at the pH, which is the isoelectric point, you have a strong aggreg aggregation because there is no repulsive forces. So you do the experiment and you verify your theory, you are very happy. When you do that with a nanocomposite, initially they are designed to be hydrophobic. Of course, when you put them in water, they are floating. But after a while, if you have a gentle steering after one hour, two hours, as uh, Jerome already explained, then you have three phases. One hydrophobic layer on top, a uh, part which is dispersed, so a colloidal phases, which is stable for a week, even if we did some experiment just after two days, we have seen that for a week it's stable, and a deposition phases. So there is a strong change, and it's very difficult to predict that kind of behavior. So initially, the compound can be very different if we look at the bare versus uh, the coated uh, uh, particles, so they can be hydrophilic or hydrophobic, so there is, is the big difference. And in, in the case of titanium, one of the biggest difference, if we look at the ecotoxicity, is that for the sunscreen, they are not generating ROS. So then we try to uh, reproduce, even if it's very, very difficult to, to, to have a uh, uh, 
alteration procedure that is really similar to what can occur in, in natural SEM. Of course, we cannot, but we try to be as close as possible. So we are working with light and without light and trying to uh, make some, uh, some dispersion with gentle steering, as I said, and try to look at uh, the stable phases because we were most mostly interested in the stable phase in, uh, compared to the, the settling one. We wanted to look at the dispersion of these settling phases. So, uh, Jérôme mentioned a little bit that point uh, before. So, when you put this compound in, in water, they, they, they are forming big chunks. So, uh, and when of, of micron size uh, aggregates are very, bi very big. After 30 minutes, two hours, you see that the, the colloidal fraction, so below one micron, uh, increase, and here this is a, a distribution in volume. So in terms of numbers of particles, we didn't do the conversion, but the majority of particles are below one micron. Uh, so there is a colloidal phases which is stable for, as I said, a week uh, in our experiment. But if we do the mass balance, in fact, it, in terms of mass, it's just 25% of the total mass of the, of the product which is incorporated in water, and the rest is generally settling. So we try to understand why we have this change in aggregation size. So first of all, we try to look at the zeta potential as function of the pH. And if you look at, you know, remember the curve for the pure and the bare titanium dioxide with a isoelectric point between 5.5 to 6. If you look at the age uh, compound, uh, we see that at pH 7, for instance, they are still positively charged. That can explain the fact that they stop disaggregating after two days. Uh, and if you look at this curve, and if, if you compare, I don't have the comparison, but if you compare with aluminum hydroxide, you can have very, very similar pattern in terms of zeta potential as function of the pH. So then we try to better understand what's going on at the surface, because remember, there is two layers. So we try to look first at the PDMS, or the siloxane, and it's clear that after a few hours, almost 90% of the silicon is really dissolved uh, in, into water, and the remaining part of the surface is fully oxidized. So the, 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 the metal group are uh, oxidized, and you form like uh, uh, some patches of silicate at the surface, and the aluminum hydroxide or oxyhydroxide remain uh, quite stable, even if you have seen some modification of the structure with uh, aluminum NMR. And the core remain perfectly stable, I mean, which is not a big surprise. So now we know that the surface after two days is becoming aluminum surface, so we can understand why the zeta potential is really similar to aluminum particles. And we know that we don't have this uh, PDMS, so we can understand why at the beginning there is such big aggregate, because there is hydrophobic interaction. And so these hydrophobic interactions are forming large, large aggregate. And this hydrophobic interaction disappears with time. So anyway, uh, so we have try to quantify the release, try to characterize the release, uh, the type of product we have uh, as release uh, samples. So I try to look at the, at the time. And so we try to play and make really rough, rough estimation of what can be released in natural system. Of course, we don't have any data. And so we try to compare our data to uh, already published data with two examples. One paper was looking at the swimmers in Zurich Lake for a swimming season, so uh, July, August maybe less, I don't know, in Switzerland, but, uh, and so we just try to add only one hypothesis, which is we suppose that all, uh, among all the commercial sunscreen, 20% are using inorganic compounds like titanium or zinc, and half of them is titanium and half of them are zinc. It's a rough estimation. And if we do so, and, we've, and if we compare with the data that were uh, published in this paper, the quantity of titanium that could be released is, is, not, is quite significant. It's, compared to the almost one ton that is uh, estimated by the, 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 the authors. And we did the same with another paper where they tried to look at the release of uh, organic UV filters uh, in the coral reef barriers around the, the world. And here again, you know, it's uh, around 10% of the total uh, amount of uh, UV filter. So it's quite significant. Of course, it's really rough estimation. I mean, we need to work on that. Anyway, so now we know the release product. We know the quantity. We know the, the speciation. We try to determine whether there are but more toxic or less toxic uh, compared to bare titanium particles. So from the literature now, we have evidence that titanium dioxide is, for instance, uh, toxic to Daphnia, and with light is more toxic. So I just grabbed this paper from the literature, but we, we can have a, a review and, and we can find other papers uh, dealing with this kind of information. And so they, they can kill uh, Daphnia even at low concentration under light. So now what's going on with our 
released product uh, that uh, can generate a stable suspension even it's, if it's just 25% of the total mass of the, of the released product. So we did some experiment with Daphnia and the first point is that up to 10 milligrams per liter we didn't see any uh, little uh, effect uh, and we did the same for the second generation for, so for the, uh, the, the, the young and there also no little effect so compared to bare titanium dioxide it seems that these compounds are a little bit less toxic or less toxic to Daphnia. And then we, uh, we have seen only one effect, which is uh, related to the reproduction rate, and it's, in fact, the most signif significant effect is for the young, so the second generation. It seems that the reproduction rate decreased a little bit, but the toxicity seems to be less important than uh, compared to bare titanium dioxide. And also we did some experiment with fishes, like Daniel, and the first point is that we just look at the hatching of the, the embryos, and we have seen that at the highest concentration, which is 10 milligrams per liter, which is quite high, the hatching seems to be uh, occurring one day before, uh, so it's, it's significant, even if after uh, hatching the, the, the larvae are still living, so there is, there is no toxicity uh, for the larvae. Then we also look at the, the survival of, this, uh, of the Daniel uh, after, after two weeks, and again, the effect is not that, that strong, but there is a significant effect uh, for the IRS concentration, even if it's, if it's not drastic, as I said. So the only uh, effect we have seen uh, to try to explain the mortality that is increasing a little bit is the activity of the digestive enzyme, which is affected by this nano. So we don't know if it's really a direct effect or an indirect effect due to the contamination of the food. Anyway, and then we also try to continue to make like uh, um, a very simplified trophic transfer from algae that were contaminated, these contaminated algae were used as food for the Daphnia, that were used as food for the Danio. And at the end, we look at the effect on the Danio. No mortality on the Danio, no gross effect, and in that case, no digestive effect either. So, it was surprising. Of course, my background is in geology, so the first question I, I, I was asking to my colleague is, do you know whether the, the, the Danio are really in contact with, with Nano? So we, we need really to look at the distribution of the nano uh, uh, along this uh, simplified trophic chain. So the biodistribution and the transfer from the algae to the danio. So before that, I would like to make a little digression because uh, we are here with the Q-Nano and talking about infrastructure, a nice platform, beautiful tools, and we'd like to introduce a French platform which is called Nano ID, ID for identification, not for ideas. Uh, oh, sorry, I try to, uh, sorry. So, uh, and it's an X-ray uh, based platform use, using mainly microscopy or spectroscopy and, and, and scattering. And we already have some, uh, some explanation with Pixie, for instance, this morning, also uh, uh, how the, uh, the beam interact with, uh, with, uh, with samples. And I would like to show you the, the, the interest on, on working with this kind of, uh, of technology. So as you know, when a beam, it can be an X-ray beam, electron beam, particulate beam interact with, with, matter, with matter, you can have absorption. And as soon as energy is absorbed by the, by the system, the matrix, then of course this energy is released, uh, whether via electron or via a, a, a light in the X-ray domain, and generally both occur. And so uh, the light that is emitted is a fluorescent light in the, from the X-ray domain uh, up to, uh, to, the, to the, the light uh, domain. And this is exactly what we do when we do an EDX experiment under an uh, electron microscope for instance, when we do the chemical mapping. So it's exactly the same, the same uh, uh, effect. What is interesting with X-ray is that absorption occurs at discrete energies. And so these energies are very characteristic of the absorbing atom. As you can see here, I don't want to detail, but the energy, the, when you want to eject the 1S electron from iron, the energy is very different from manganese. So you can really select on which atom you want to play. And of course, the ener because of this discrete energy, there's no need to label the, uh, the, the, the metallic particles uh, with X-ray spectrum microscopy. So when the Daphnia or any organism like us, when we are doing uh, a radiography, when we are irradiated by uh, an X-ray beam, we, have, we are absorbing the energy and then we are releasing this energy via this fluorescence. And this light, the, 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 the X-ray uh, emitted light, uh, uh, the, uh, if you have a detector that can discriminate the energy, you, you, can, you can see that the energy of calcium fluorescence is different from titanium, etc. So we can be uh, selective and determine which are the elements in your sample, and the intensity of the peak is a quantity, so you can also be semi-quantitative, which is quite interesting. So if you do uh, hyperspectral uh, spectral microscopy, so um, using ISCRAY, 
then you can you can have a chemical map of the calcium of the titanium and here in the case you can see clearly that the titanium is really in the digestive tract of the of the daphnia so of course it's a simple example and very very, very maybe extreme example but the point is that these two day image is interesting but not enough because here of course it's in digestive tract but we don't know if the, the tract is fully uh, is full or if it's just at top the, at, the, at, the, at the surface of the of the tract so 3D image should be better. So, that, uh, so before that, I would like to, to introduce this two, the limitation of these 2D X-ray uh, techniques. At the lab scale, the sensitivity is 40 ppm, so it's not that good. Even if it's dry weight, if you work on synchrotron, it's much better. It can be below 1 ppm. We, have develop, we, have, we are developing a, uh, a new detector at the lab scale in collaboration with people from synchrotron. And I don't want to detail, but uh, with... Uh, very good energy resolution, we can go down to few ppm even at the lab scale. And, of, and what is very interesting, for some uh, element, like for instance cerium, silver, we also can have some information on the redox state at the lab scale, which is interesting. But as I said, today is not enough. So we, we would like to have a 3D image. So here we can see the, I don't know how to start the, the there is already a film moving. I don't know if it's going to start or not. Ah, ah what I did. So, sorry, it's not working. So, ah, yeah, there we go. Wow. You, you, you go the inside of the daphnia. So here you see really the, tit the, the titanium dioxide in inside the digestive tract. And you also can see some, uh, some spot where the titanium is associated to protozoan. I don't know if, if the, it is the good pr uh, translation. So because of that, now we know it's really inside the digestive tract and not moving across this, this tract. So it's really interesting. So this, uh, this technology now is, uh, is uh, available in our lab. It's a natural platform. The, the, the platform is, as I said, is nano ID. So we have 2D chemical and mineralogical X-ray imaging machine, 3D machine, and we, go, we can have tomograph, uh, micro tomograph with almost one micron resolution, and we can go down to 15 nanometers, which is very similar to what we can do on synchrotron. Of course, synchrotron uh, are much faster in terms of uh, acquisition time. Uh, and this platform is open. It's French funding, but it's open to international. Uh, so we already collaborate with uh, Spanish people, of course, American people with the uh, Saint. And so if it's interesting for people here, you can contact us uh, to, to have some information about this. So back to the trophic transfer. You remember there is no toxicity when we did the aquatic trophic transfer, but is there any exposure or, or is there any uh, trophic transfer? In fact, yes, the algae was strongly contaminated with titanium. You have seen the, 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 the Daphnia with uh, the, 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 the track which is f full of titanium. In terms of the, you remember the etching for the Danio? Here we can see the titanium surrounding the, uh, the chorion. And in fact, the chorion, the permeability of the chorion is modified by this absorption of, of titanium. And certainly, this is the reason why the etching occurred too fast, even if there is no penetration of titanium inside the, uh, the embryo. So here you can see the, also the, the maps for titanium in, in a small danio. You see here the, the calcium, and some titanium is associated to the animal. So transfer, trophic transfer occurred, but the toxicity was not that high, maybe, maybe because uh, you remember the, the composite in sunscreen were designed not to generate ROS. And if you look after the aging, uh, you still see that these compounds are not generating ROS, which, which means that, in fact, the aluminum layer is still protecting uh, and uh, avoiding this ROS generation. So it can be an explanation. It's not the only explanation, but it can be one of the explanations. So as a summary of this, uh, of this sunscreen work, initially, the compound can be very different. Some of properties, hydrophobic, no ROS generation. After aging in water, they can change in terms of dispersion size and uh, property with water, so they can become hydrophilic. S since the aluminum layer still remain and still protects, the toxicity seems to be very, very low compared to bare uh, nanoparticles. So as I said, I was not paid by the cosmetic company. So, uh, so the initial question was, can we extrapolate results from bare particles to particles that are in commercial product? The answer, unfortunately, is no in this case. Uh, so like this. The point, of course, we did uh, preliminary experiments, just one week experiment, so we need longer time to know whether or not this aluminum will remain or not. I mean, it's, it's a big issue. And so then, what can we do next? I mean, <laughs> should we work on bare particles or coated particles with, ki with kind of coating? 
who is right? Uh, what, should we, what should we do? In fact, if we think about the life stages of a product, in fact, we need all information. And so that's what we try to, we try to change our point of view four years ago because we are only focused on the use of commercial product, which was, we are not very satisfied. And in fact, if we think of a very simplified uh, product life of, of a, any, any kind of product with six stages from the mining to the synthesis of, of nanomaterials, the formulation, so the production of coatings, incorporation, the use, and, the, and the, the end of life, then we see that we can work, we need to work on bare particles as well as on coated one, as well as on aged one. So the idea when we try to, uh, to have a, a more rational uh, investigation is to design on which kind of stages we want to work. And so we, we, we can do that simple uh, life cycle, uh, so value chain, sorry, with uh, titanium in the, compo in, the, in the sunscreen, you see that there is titanium bare than in, in bare nano particles, composite with aluminum, PDMS, or hydrophilic stuff, incorporated in sunscreen, aging. And it seems that the exposure could be quite high because, in fact, the sunscreen is also the end of life because the, 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 the cream is, will release in water. So the, last, the two last uh, stages are, in fact, in the same. And we try to, uh, to go a little bit further with other kind of materials. So here, yeah, we, this, morning we, this, mo this morning we had a, 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 an example of nano paint. So uh, this is another one, not with zinc, but with cerium dioxide. And again, for this paint, the composite, the cerium composite are formed with a citrate layer, and then they are incorporated. So we can apply this very simple scheme to uh, quite a lot of product. And so we try to have a larger uh, investigation trying to focus on different kind of pro product in which you know, so w we selected uh, matrix that are liquid sunscreen that are solid cement uh, self clinic cement uh, or plastic in which nano silica are incorporated and also we are working on, on the, 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 the paint so we try to work on, on a large bunch of product large bunch and I want just to I want to show you just some results about for instance the nano paint. So the point is, what kind of aging experiment we can use? And the point is that when you work with people uh, from this, this field, they say but there is a lot of norm normalizations uh, tested for, to test the stability of paint. So just use this one. And the idea for the group was really just to adapt the protocol, just to implement a little bit. And the idea was just to recover what is going uh, out from the paint. But the test was exactly the same as is used by the companies when they try to test the stability of the product. And so, I don't want to deal too much because we are, it's, it's quite late, but we have seen that there is some release uh, here, uh, but we need light. Without light, there is no release, even if, the, if there is water and UV. Uh, UV is really important to, re to have a, a, a first release of, of cerium. And then we try to look on the, on the wood, where are the nano located? And so, based on our 2D imaging, we were able to look at the first layer. It, this is a section. So we see a, a, a small, uh, it's, it's a 45 to 50 micron uh, thickness uh, layers. After aging, we were a little bit surprised because the thickness increased a little bit. So it seems that the nano is going inside the, the wood. So anyway, but again, 2D is not enough. So we want to go on a 3D. So now we can do a tomography. Here you have a, uh, you can see the, the wood fibers. And it, in that example, it's very interesting because here you have the layer of paint and you see that the fibers are in the same, uh, they are not perpendicular to the surface. So, in fact, in that case, there is no diffusion of the nano inside the wood. And you can see here on the nano uh, tomograph, here this is just one cell. You see the nano are really with the paint and not inside the wood. So the cellulose is making a, a good barrier to the penetration of, of nano in wood. So now, what we try to understand is why are the, what are the mechanisms of the release? Can we determine a parameter or um, a simple test on the, on, the, uh, on the structure of the paint that will help us to, uh, to predict the release of nano. And so now we try to go back to this very beginning uh, release of cyan to look at the, at the paint and what is the quality of the paint. So we have the same with uh, self-cleaning cement. I will not detail that. I will go directly to the conclusion, but we do the, we do the same on cement. So as a conclusion, uh, it's clear that in a, in, in a nano safety con context, it it's certainly very important to work not only on bare nanoparticles, but also on the residues that are released from products that are already on the market. But of course, the difficulty is 
uh, what kind of experiment, what kind of edging experiment we need to uh, adapt. And the question is, generally we try to make some generalization of what we obtain on nano, and we try to make some nano families, nano oxide, uh, carbon particles, uh, metallic particles, because they have similar properties. Now I think it's not possible to do this uh, discrimination per particles, but maybe per product, so paint, cement, whatever the nanos that are associated. So then maybe we can have a similar type of protocol for the aging. And of course, now we need to test the, the behavior of this uh, release product in a more realistic scenario, and we need to, to work on, on mesocosm experiments. So, uh, and that, for that, we, we're going to do that with our colleague at the Saint. And I'm concluding with uh, a lot of uh, acknowledgement for the group at the CRH, and also a lot of French colleagues, and also international collaboration with uh, Tranfield or Inasmet in, in Spain, and Duke uh, with the Saint. Jérôme already mentioned that we are organizing this conference in July, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. So, thank you, Jérôme, for this uh, really nice talk and interesting uh, subject. So, do you have any questions, Michael? Thank you for this interesting study. And uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting that you showed with regard to the, the aging and the weathering. Um, did you consider that some people water in uh, sweet water and some in salt water? And what are the differences between media if you did the, that? The, the point, yeah, we, we, so that's that going to be the next step. Because the point, as Jérôme already mentioned, when you increase the, the concentration of salt, you have a strong aggregation. So that's a big issue for us, uh, really to provide and to be sure that, because the idea is to uh, do the alteration, recover the byproduct, and give the byproduct to a toxicity test or ecotoxicity test. So if we do the same in salted water, then we're going to have aggregation and strong aggregation. So how can we provide uh, sediment uh, as byproduct to be tested in uh, ecotox aqua with aquatic system? Of course, with benthic organisms, it's different. So we still are puzzle puzzled by this uh, ex type of experiment. But of course, it, is, it will be very different in terms of aging. So uh, no, we didn't have done yet, but that's the next step uh, in September <laughs> with a new PhD. <laughs> I guess my question is the same as the one for Jerome. Uh, so we talk about different receiving environments, but can you kind of move on from the case-by-case -case study to think about, for example, the coatings, you know, if they keep the, yeah. the materials in dispersion or, again, group by material, by shape, and so on, kind of moving towards that area? Yeah, that's really something we really want to address. How can we have a generic approach? And as I said in the conclusion, Working with product, the idea certainly is not to have a generalization per nanoparticles, but maybe per product. So maybe we need to have a, a similar approach with all paint and try to see whether if you have cerium or zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, uh, we need to, uh, to see whether the release starts at the same time. And if it's the, if the case, then we can generalize for any nanomaterials, and maybe the, the paint will be the much more important parameter to control in terms of aging than the, than the nano. So, yeah, that's really the idea, trying to have a more generic approach, but product per product, not nano per nano. That's the idea we have now. Maybe we are wrong, but <laughs> that's the idea. Any more comments? In the Daphne experiment, you had shown that the nanoparticles are uptaken by the uh, small Daphne. Uh, and, and, uh, and are enriched in the body, in the in ingestion part. But uh, are you sure that the aluminum oxide layer still is stable once they pass the body, the stomach, for instance, where you have acidic conditions? Right. So you see the titanium dioxide, but can you see the aluminum as well? That's the big issue. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult. We try many different techniques because the quantity of aluminum is very low and you're in the Daphne has already have a, a, a blank level of aluminum so it's very difficult to discriminate and uh, unfortunately now we failed uh, 
even we work on the pellets, you know, the, the depuration, we try, we fail to be sure or not the titanium is present or not. So what we try to do is to make some indirect experiments. So we're trying to look at the uh, generation of ROS. So we s the idea was, is the aluminum layer still there? Maybe there is no ROS generation, and it was the case. So we just have an indirect information about the stability of, uh, of with Daphnia. But with Daniel, we have no evidence because, as you said, the acidic pH will be uh, drastic for the release of aluminum. And we had some experiment with uh, uh, gastric uh, solution and the aluminum is released. That, that We know that now. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, Patrick. With the X-ray microscopy, did you say that you're also able to identify? Because, I mean, this is, a X, is this an X-radia instrument, the, the X-radia, the XLM that you showed? But um, you have to use a, san a standard, correct? Or, or so, you yeah, as you're right. I mean, for the tomography, you just are just sensitive to the absorbing element. So you don't know exactly if it's calcium, titanium, vanadium. So you need, that's why we have a combination of platforms. So we have tomography, but also we have this 2D uh, chemical map where we know because of the fluorescence which kind of element we have. So and also we go to synchronous. Oh, yeah, right. We, we, just with one machine is not efficient. So this way is nice, but it's not uh, that fantastic. <laughs> Any more? Thanks. So if, if uh, we thank again, Jerome. Thank you very much.